gastrointestinal parasites. There's other parasites out there, but they're generally not a threat, such as uh, uh, tapeworms. Generally, they're not a threat. But the, the barber pole worm is going to suck all the red blood cells or consume all the red blood cells out of the uh, animal. And next thing you know, they're anemic. They've got bottle jaw on the underside of their chin. Their face is swelling up. And coccidiosis tends to affect your, your goats and younger lambs, your kids and your lambs. And it, it does just like parasites. It scars the intestines to where they don't absorb nutrition like they once did. So sometimes your animal may be barber for worms, may get coccidiosis, but, and you may treat it and may clear up, but the animal just never does do right. And that's a lot of that is from the damage done to their intestines from these parasites. So that, that's something a lot of people don't think about. They say, well, I treated them and they still died. And they'll say, well, did, did you make sure there weren't any worms or coxie just left? And they said, yeah, but they'd gotten pretty sick. And so what happens, another thing that happens with coccidiosis in uh, lambs or kids, they get real bad diarrhea. People rush around trying to figure out how to treat the diarrhea or the coccidiosis with chemicals, but you know, but Valba not Valbase and uh, Albon and things like that. But I tell people, treat that later on. Focus on getting these animals rehydrated. They've had real bad diarrhea. They've become dehydrated. They've become weak. Uh, anything you can use on a human to control diarrhea, I used to use Pepto-Bismol for the goats. You can use any, you know, anti-diarrhea medicine, you can use any of those uh, other things, Pepto-Bismol, and then make sure they're getting their electrolytes, make sure they're getting some Gatorade or Powerade, whatever you think they'll drink the best. And then focus on treating them for coccidiosis. But that way you can keep some anti diarrhea medicine around. You can keep some electrolytes. You may or may not keep medicine around for coccidiosis, but that usually will buy you some time to uh, run to the feed store or your, your vet and get things like that. Uh, nutrition and mineral deficiencies and imbalances. Somebody earlier asked about copper. If they get a copper deficiency or an imbalance, all these minerals play vital roles in the health of anima animals. Not only health, but the physical development, uh, the growth rate, uh, the reproduction capabilities. You know, that's, that's a whole presentation in itself. I've done many of them on nutrition and mineral deficiencies or imbalances. Unsanitary condition. I, I admit I'm guilty of that. When I had goats in a barn, I didn't clean out my barn as often I, as I should have. Uh, but I did make sure to use hydrated lime and put it on the barn floors once or probably twice a year in the spring and in the fall to control odor, to help break down the urine, to help break down the manure. Was it a complete solution? No, I still had to hire somebody from time to time to come in there with a backhoe to clean out the barn, but that's, that's another story in itself. Unsanitary conditions in the pastures, if you just have one pastures for your goats or sheep, like most people do, and you can't rotate your pastures, it's going to build up manure out there. Builds up manure, and next thing you know, you've got some severe gastrointestinal parasite problems. So I always tell people, if you only have an acre, divide it in half or in fourths. And that way you'll have two different paddocks or four different paddocks, divide it in thirds, whatever you can possibly do to rotate your pastures every so often. Most of the time you figure about 30 days. External parasites. I did not know till after a couple of years, goats could get lice and they do tend to get lice about twice a year. Because you'll think that, man, that sure is a lot of dirt in their fur. And you'll go to look at it and go, oh, gross, that dirt's moving about, it's crawling about. That's a sign you got a problem with lice. So you have to uh, dust them with, you can use some of the more mild insecticides out there. 
seven dust or something like that or most speeds supply stores are going to sell something for lice or livestock you can use that sort of thing but it does happen it's a little bit embarrassing but everybody has a problem toxic vegetation oh my gosh if you start reading all the lists out there in books and magazines and on the internet about things that can kill a goat you will not get in the goat or sheep business <laughs> because it's just it's amazing uh, mountain laurel, that's something that'll kill them. Black cherry. Now, black cherry trees are something that grows almost on everybody's property, but goats can eat the bark off the trees, goats can eat the leaves off the trees, and it doesn't kill them. But let a storm come along and break, break some of those branches, or the tree falls over, and then the tree emits what they call prussic acid, and that's what kills goats or sheep or horses or whatever that decides to eat the, the dead tree's leaves. Now, on down the road, when the branches of, you know, tree's been dead for a while, the branches are edible, but I do not recommend it. The best thing you can do if you have a black cherry tree that falls down or a cherry tree that falls down in your pasture area is just haul it out of there. That way you don't have to worry about accidentally killing any animals. Uh, azaleas, you know, sometimes some of us farmers, we not only have goats or sheep, but we also have shrubberies in our yard that need trimming. And people invariably look at those goats and sheep and say, man, if I just throw those branches over there, they'll have something to eat. And of course, the goats and sheep are there at the fence, they're ready. If you throw azalea bushes over there, it's going to make them real sick and possibly kill them. So be careful you know, do some research and find out. Those are probably one of the, some of the few things out there that are readily found. The mountain laurel is one, the uh, black cherry trees, wild black cherry trees, and the azaleas. Now there's a lot of other things out there. It could be toxic, but I always have to remind people, usually it has to be consumed in large quantities. In other words, your goat has nothing else to eat. They're not gonna eat something toxic uh, by choice, they're going to eat it out of necessity because mom teaches those uh, kids and lambs what to eat and what not to eat given the opportunity. So don't get caught up in that, but just be aware there's a few things you got to pay attention to. Uh, when you talk about upkeep, when you talk about health issues, the best thing you can do is develop a working relationship with a veterinarian because when it all comes down to it, you need to get advice from a veterinarian, not, a, not necessarily a fellow goat producer, not necessarily from what you heard on the internet. You need to talk to a veterinarian, find out, or you may have to take the animal into the vet's office and get them to figure out what the problem is. And uh, I have seen some people, even horse owners over the years, fight, develop working with a vet and then they'll call up a vet, you know, at eight o'clock at night and say, hey, I need your help. And uh, the vet's going, I don't know who you are. You've never been in my office. I can't help you. They've got to have that uh, uh, vet client relationship. And then they're more likely to help you. Now they'll tell you if you need to bring the animal in. In most cases, they're gonna try and resolve it over the phone and sell you some medicine that you may need to come pick up. But there again, that's another, <laughs> session all in itself is talking about health and care and things like that for the uh, goats and sheep. Somebody was asking earlier about trimming hooves. They have some, uh, I should have brought them in here into the room. Uh, they have some really good hoof trimmers out there for goats and sheep. I like to buy the more expensive ones and I forget their brand and I'll go find them in a minute and show them to you when we take a break that do not have a sharp tip on the end because invariably what happens when I'm trimming goats and sheep, either I'm gonna bleed, the goat or sheep's gonna bleed, or both of us. <laughs> because the goat jerks when you least expect it or sheep does it, and you take those sharp tips from those hoof trimmers and they sell them at Jeffers, they sell them at feed stores, co-ops, things like that. They have these very sharp tips and I end up poking myself with them. Now, when you go to trim hooves, you're also gonna have the experience, invariably it happens, 
that you cut their hooves too short and they start to bleed. It's what we call quick them, Q-U-I-C-K. And so when you quick them, they start to bleed. Make sure you have some uh, uh, septic powder. I think that's what they call it, septic powder. And uh, you're able to put on there, and it's not baking soda, but it's one of those other things. You can use that too to help stop the blood flow. And just don't try and cut their hoods all, all at once. Just cut it in thin layers as you work your way down there. And it's kind of like a, clipping a dog's toenails. If you just wait and clip them once a year, you're going to get some blood because you're going to cut back too far at some point. So if you're trimming your goat hooves two times a year, which most of the time, that's going to be sufficient. There you can pick the spring and fall, not the middle of summer when it's too hot. Uh, you know, you're trimming them back a couple of times, those blood vessels are going to draw back in and you don't risk uh, quickening them as much. Learn to check your eyelids for anemia. I talked earlier about the barber pole worm. Barber pole worm, what'll happen is if you're checking the inner eyelids of the goat or sheep and they have a bad infestation of barber pole worms, not only will their jaw get swollen, but their, their uh, inner eyes are gonna get white. Instead of being pink as my face probably is right now, they're gonna get very white and you've got anemia. There you go, you know, you've gotta get some, uh, uh, red blood cell or something like that. Red cell, uh, they have it for horses, they have it for goats. You can try and rebuild them. Worst case scenario, you end up going to the vet and they put them on a uh, drip IV. And trust me, put, getting the goats to stay still and walk around with a, a drip IV is, not, IV is not easy. Learn to do fecal egg counts. Now, the reality of it is, if you have a vet that'll work with you and give you a discount on taking in fecal egg counts, and it doesn't take much. People used to bring me baggy foals. and was like, no, no, no. All I need is a, a gram or two, just a couple of pellets. And uh, you learn to do your own fecal egg counts if you want to invest in a microscope. And you can see how many worm eggs in there, how much coccidia is, is in there, and whether you also need to treat your animals but more importantly, you can see how, if you do it pre and post, you can see, okay, I counted 90 eggs last time I looked at that. I gave them the chemical warmer and I see 10 eggs. I reduced it significantly, my warmer work. Because people used to call me up and say, well, my goat died two months ago. What did it die of? And I'm going, how the heck am I going to answer that? And so I'll tell them, well, did you warm your goats? I, yeah. And I said, you know, you sure you want, I told you I warned my goats. And then you'll say something like, uh, how do you know the warmer work? I told you I warned my goats. <laughs> and so you'll say, no, did you do a pre and post to know if your warmer work? No. So there again, if you have a vet that will work with you, they can do those fecal egg counts. You know, you take a few fecal egg counts in, shouldn't cost you more than seven to ten dollars per sample. Now I'm sure some vet will be glad to leave you money and charge you 15 or 20, but you need to find a different vet when you're you're doing that. I've done classes on the fecal egg counts. Uh, I don't mind doing classes, but usually people when they find out what's involved, they decide they don't want to do that. Because you got to spend about a hundred dollars a microscope, uh, 10 or 15 dollars on supplies, and you have to be able to use your kitchen sink to make what I call poop soup. <laughs> In reality, you don't have to use your uh, kitchen sink, but you basically have to do something. You need some water from a garden hose or something to clean everything up. Remember, like I talked earlier about the lice, check them a couple of times a year. Lice can usually happen in the spring, in the summer, and in the fall. So you want to check your goats, goat or sheep, if you have hair sheep, coat a couple times a year to see if they have lice or not. Sometimes if you have real wet pastures or real swampy soil, you're going to have problems with foot rot or scald. There's medicine to treat that with, something you'll have to get from your vet or order online from a local veterinarian or from a veterinarian supply place. But uh, it, it's not pretty when it, it develops between their toes. 
right in there between their, well, they only have two toes, right in between their toes there, and they'll be limping around. Another thing that can happen with goat or sheep is pink eye or sore mouth. Uh, it's The pink eye is very painful for the goats and sheep because sunlight hurts their eyes when they have pink eye. The best thing you can do for a goat or sheep that has pink eye is get them into the barn, get them out of the sunlight, and it'll take about five days to clear up. Now, the thing to think about, sore mouth is similar. It tends to happen in young kids. They Not very often it will. It tends to develop around their mouth. They'll go to nurse off their mother and it hurts their mouth so they don't nurse as much as they need to and they start losing some weight. So the, the other bad news about pink eye and sore mouth is it's also contagious to people. It's what they call a zoonotic disease. So you have to be very, very careful if when you go out and work with animals that have pink eye or, or sore mouth, even cows get it, wear some latex gloves. These days and times, everybody has latex gloves around. And uh, if you're gonna handle the animals, yes, there is some medicine that you can get to treat pink eye or sore mouth, but the reality is if you get those goats or sheep out of the sunlight and in some shade and the uh, sore mouth is gonna be the same practice, if you treat it with chemicals or medicine, it'll go away in seven days. If you don't treat it, it goes away in a week. So you have to decide what you think will work best, but please do not let your kids get around any animals that have that and you don't want to get it either. And so when you're trying to figure out some health issues and upkeep, talk with your vet, talk with other producers. Yes, you can look up information on, on the website, and there's lots of good information out there, but sometimes when you start getting opinions of other folks, you get some misinformation. Uh, will tobacco get rid of worms? I've, I've heard that, but you know I've never done any pre and post on, on animals to know if it works or not. What else was it? I'm sure there's some other things out there, some home remedies like that. Um, Robert, is now a good time to stop you for some questions? It's been yeah, a little over 20 minutes. That's what I was going to say. Okay, good. Um, I'll just start from the bottom and go up. Um, how, Constance asked, how often should you deworm or do checks on um, worms or the fecal egg counts? Good question, because the answer to that is it depends. <laughs> That's your typical extension answer for everything. <laughs> if your goats, I would check my goats and do random fecal samples unless you see a specific goat that appears puny, appears not to be doing well, doesn't feel well, lags behind when the other goats come into the barn, it just walks real slow and coming in. I would plan on doing random fecal egg samples anywhere from uh, every three months to every six months. A lot of it depends on how often you can rotate your pastures. And then there's always the goat or sheep that you just can't get rid of the worms. Now that one needs to go live somewhere else or be somebody's dinner. But uh, <laughs> there's always gonna be some animals that don't do well and you need to call those. But I would say every, like I said, every three months to six months, do the fecal egg counts, check the eyelids for anemia. And, and when I say random checks, people get go, I got 100 goats, I can't check all of them. No, just maybe check one out of 20 or one out of 10, depending on how many you have, one out of five, you know, and, and pick out the ones that don't look good. If they have a rough looking coat, it could be either be lice, it could be, or it could be internal parasites are causing the problem. So if you see one, oh my gosh, that one just has such a bad looking coat, check its eyelids have a fecal egg count done, and uh, it, could, it could be your problem. And don't try and keep your favorite goat just because it keeps on, you know, despite the fact that you love it, if it keeps on getting worms, it needs to be gone. We need to call. Next question. Okay, Cynthia asked, um, what info can you give on polio in goats? Uh, goat polio can be caused by, uh, if I remember correctly, it is uh, wet feed or mineral deficiencies. 
hmm. you know, basically feed that has mold growing in it, if I remember correctly. It's been a long time since so I had to deal with that. But there's some medicines out there. Uh, let's see, if I remember correctly, goat polio, it's, uh, and don't quote me on this, I'm not a vet by any means, <laughs> but there's, uh, uh, is it thiamine? If I remember correctly, goat polio leads to a thiamine deficiency, and you have to give them shots of thiamine and something else. But there again, people sometimes get caught up in all these diseases, and I used to say the same thing about that as I did some of these other problems. If these g diseases were this prevalent, I would not get in the goat business and wouldn't recommend anybody. So the likelihood of goat polio and uh, is very small, but they're going to develop a working relationship with your vet, look for information on the internet, and always be prepared. Okay, a similar question from K9 Kim. Can mineral deficiency cause coat to change color to white or have fish tail? Uh, it it depends, mineral deficiency in certain situations can. But the likelihood of that happening is is almost rare. Will it happen? Yes, from time to time, somebody's going to come up with that was their experience. But you'd have to have some blood drawn to verify what was deficient in their uh, system to determine what to do about it. Okay. Um, a question that goes back to the poisonous plants you were talking about. Someone, yeah. at, or Constance, asked if mimosa trees were dangerous. Most, I think they may have some toxicity to them. There again, based on my experience, I've seen my goats eat some of that stuff in small quantities. And so there again, it may go back to in large, if they consume large quantities of mimosa, they may be toxic. But I've heard that before, that mimosa trees are toxic to them. If you've got mimosa trees and you have concerns, I just cut them down. Okay. Um, Kimber asked, is there a difference between meat goats? She was gifted some boar mixes and dairy goats. Is it just the milk quantity or is there more differences? Oh, there's more difference. It's the milk quantity, your dairy goats, of course, because they're dairy, they're going to produce more milk and milk quality. The boar goats or meat goats produce less milk, but it has higher nutrient levels, especially it has a little bit higher protein. I mean, it has to because the, the babies are not getting as much milk from their mama in the case of meat goats. And so they need to, uh, uh, versus the dairy goats where they can get a bunch of milk from their mother. So the meat goat milk tends to uh, be a little bit higher in protein levels. Okay, um, a question, and let me just say, someone asked if we ha could um, share the PowerPoint. So mm -hmm. you sent me the PDF, so if people will leave their um, email address in the chat screen, then I'll email the PDF that you sent me. Okay, another question. Um, Kay asks, she wants goats to clear the land and as a pet. Um, do they wonder? Question. And do you need a fence? Question. Well, it depends. I've been to third world countries where they tied their goats up and let them clear up browse and brush. <laughs> uh, and I've seen that here in the States too. And it, it can be done, but you might as well say for all practical purposes, you need a fence even if they're just pets and cleaning up brows or stuff like that. Because what happens is invariably what used to happen to me when my goats would get out, they would go over to the neighbor's garden and their fruit trees and just decimate their garden and fruit trees. The first time or two, I get a nice phone call. Hey, your goats are out, please get them up. The third time I get a phone call from the phone slammed down right after said, come get your goats. <laughs> Very good. Let's see, one more question was, um, or two more questions. One was, um, can you just keep a goat as a pet and not eat them? Mm. Yeah, you can do that. And I'll address that in a minute as well. Uh, there, there's nothing wrong with that if you want to keep them as pets. Uh, but 
when I, the first time I had to have some of my goats slaughtered at the butcher, I thought I'll never eat this meat, but I found it was pretty good. But yeah, there's nothing wrong with uh, keeping them around as pets and using them to clean up things, you know. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a, in a few minutes, but yeah. Okay, I think we're caught up with our question. Okay, that's some good questions. Thank you, everybody. I, li I like it when we're more interactive with questions. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to take a break or do you want me to continue on? I think if you're good, we can keep going. Okay. okay. Okay then. So here's something else people fail to consider is they say they want to get in the goat and sheep business, but where do they get these animals from? So we're going to talk about purchasing animals in the different and breeding seasons. And then we'll go on after this and talk about breeds, which is an extensive list of all all kinds of meat and dairy. So if you're thinking about getting some goats, and I did this, and I'm so glad to this day I did it, I went around and found people that were raising goats, and some of them became friends with, and talked with them, asked them to teach me some stuff about goats. What would you recommend? Uh, you know, you just, you've got to get out there and get information. Don't just rush out there and buy some goats or sheep because you think they're cute and you want to use them for goat yoga. <laughs> make, sure, make sure you do your research on what other farms doing because not only can you learn a bit more about the different breeds you can see what they're using for fencing what kind of barns they have what shape their pastures in uh, what medicines they may keep around what tools they may keep around and consider there's going to be some people that have high-end goats and don't mind spending lots of money on that nice barn with paddocks and I mean uh, with stalls and everything in it and there's going to be people like me that they had one side of their barn for storing feed and hay and the other side for the animals to live so you're going to see all kinds of things there shop the internet that's that's going to be a, a challenge these days and times there's not many goat producers as there used to be out there there's still quite a few hair sheep producers out there but not as many goat producers uh, shop the internet, you, you know, you might have to find out what's available in your area. Find internet groups, social media groups that specialize in livestock. There was one, and they had to change up their practices recently, it's called the uh, North Alabama Livestock Producers, I think is what they're called, or Facebook group, or uh, livestock producers of North Alabama, something like that. Anyways, they used to post all kinds of animals. And it got down to, they post a whole lot of pygmy goats or dwarf Nigerian goats. Those got real popular and probably still are. But then apparently the animal rights folks got a hold of this media group and they put it, said you can't sell animals on the internet at your site. So now they put a message on there. I have dairy goats or meat goats for sale, private message me. Because they couldn't post pictures of their animals anymore, which was a selling point to me but that's just the, the way things work out so you know back in the late 90s early uh, 2000 you could go find all kinds of goat producers and uh, now a lot of people have made the switch from meat goats or dairy goats to uh, hair sheep just because they're a little bit less trouble so then if, if you're gonna talk to people about goats or sheep the question you always want to ask on the females, are they bred? Because if you can buy a goat that's already bred, you have a value added animal. So, you know, when you go to ask if they're bred, if they tell you in the middle of summer, oh yeah, they're bred, you may want to question that because meat goats have a longer breeding season, which also means they don't have to put on that cologne like dairy goats do. And generally, meat goats are going to breed from, and this is generally, from July to spring. Now, there's going to be some variation here, but I remember specifically about the middle of J July, all my meat, my male meat goats were ready to breed. And so that was fine with me because I would get babies in December, and that way it hasn't gotten real cold like January or February. Dairy goats, they tend to be... Uh, uh, bit more narrow breeding season. They will breed as early as July, but the males pretty much for some reason, nature deemed it this way, 
they don't tend to breed into the spring. And so uh, all this kind of works out for a reason, in my opinion. I don't want any goats bred in uh, September, October, because this is a five month gestation period. So you got to think, okay, if I want goats born in December, let me go back on the calendar. And I think July is the ideal month. Let them breed in July and I'll get December babies. If I don't want babies till March, I better wait till uh, uh, October to breed those goats. And so that's something else. March, spring, that's a good time for animals, goats, and sh sheep or lambs and kids to be born. So that's something to think about right there. I do not want anything born in the heat of summer. Parasites are more of a problem. The heat causes them to be less interested in nutrition and food. And so I don't want any babies if I can help it. It happens, but I don't want any babies born in uh, June, July, August, or even the middle of September. I want the temperatures to cool off a bit. Flies are less of a problem when it cools off. Your, your gastrointestinal parasites, we talked about, less of a problem. Uh, Central and Gulf Coast, you know, you can generally kid or lamb any time through the winter. It's not going to be a problem because it hardly ever gets free, below freezing down there. But nothing hurt my feelings more than when I have a baby goat or lamb born about January, February, and invariably it'd be the most coldest day of the year. And I go out there and find what I call goat sickles. You know, they, they unfortunately they, you know, the mama could only do so much to warm them up and the cold gets the best of them. That, that would hurt. So, you know, that's something I hate to see. Next slide. Breeds for meat or dairy? That's the big question. When my, I first started looking at goats and decided to get in the goat business, I took my wife with me everywhere we went. And of course, my wife is no longer alive, so I can talk about her. <laughs> but uh, I wanted meat goats and she wanted dairy goats. And so we compromised and ended up with both. And uh, I grew to like dairy goats a little bit more in the long run, but meat goats were still my favorite. There's all these different breeds of meat goats out there. There's the boar goat, there's the Kiko goat, there's the Savannah goat, it's, it's a solid white goat. The Kiko goat is a cross between wild goats and dairy goats, Sonnens, it comes out of New Zealand, Australia. The boar goat comes from South Africa. There's also the myotonic goat, which comes from Tennessee, and it's known as the uh, uh, Tennessee fainting goat. And then there's the brush or pygmy goats. Those things have been around forever and seem to be very hardy. They can get into a lot more because they're so small. Uh, one time I had pygmy goats and that thing got so fat because you get in the horse feed, you get in the goat feed. So there's all those breeds and then you can cross up some of those breeds and you get your hybrid vigor which means they're gonna be a little bit healthier, a little bit more disease tolerant, a little bit more parasite tolerant. And, you know, it's like getting a, a uh, mixed breed or a mutt that's, you know, who knows what. Those things tend to be healthier and less problems and live forever. Whereas you get some of these purebred dogs and they've got their health issues and so on and so forth. So, you know, that's something to think about. When you get the hair sheep, I really like hair sheep. You know, once I started transitioning out of goats, I tried hair sheep. There's the Katahdin, there's the Dorper, there's the St. Croix, there's the Barbados, uh, two different types of Barbados, and then there's the Royal White. Now the Royal White is catching on a little bit more, but it's kind of difficult to find around here. And then there's the Barbados, are very difficult to find around here. There again, they originated from the Caribbean or more tolerant of our type of weather. But the ones I've seen out there just didn't impress me. They, they weren't as hardy looking as the Dorper or the Katahdin. Now, supposedly, the, and I tend to agree, the Dorper are not as parasite tolerant as the Katahdin. But if you're trying to grow them out for meat, the Dorper grow out quicker than the Katahdin. Now, I tried the St. Croix for a while, and I loved them. Their temperament was pretty good but they just weren't as hardy. 
And as we're talking about these different breeds, if you want to get in the goat and hair sheep business, based on my experience, if I when I had my hair sheep in with my goats, my goats were much more aggressive towards the hair sheep. So the hair sheep tend to get pushed out of the feed trough more, tend to get pushed away from the hay, get pushed out into the rain, things like that. My goats just did not like the hair sheep. I kind of like the hair sheep, but you know. And then my wife, she got in the dairy goat business and there are all these breeds out here. I, we thought about getting Nubians, but several friends of ours said, you don't want a Nubian, they, they are needy. They're gonna stand at the fence when they see you come out the back door and start screaming. You know, but I think they're just so cute with their, their eyes and their beagle ears, their droopy ears and everything like that. But I've tried having Nubians a couple of times and it's, yeah, they were just too vocal, but they have great personalities and temperaments. Sonnen, there, there's a sable Sonnen and a white Sonnen. I love the Sonnen goats. I think they have one of the best temperaments out of the dairy goat breeds. Uh, they're fairly friendly. The, the Billies were fairly friendly. And, uh, but I bought probably 10 or 15 of them at one time just to have around. My wife made me get rid of them because they all look the same. She said, they're all solid white. I can't tell one apart from the other. Of course, she liked the uh, Alpines. And I said, they're all different colors. How can you tell one from the other? But uh, that the dairy goats, the Nigerian dwarf, I used to make fun of those things, but I got to realizing, hey, you don't need a gallon of milk a day from a dairy goat unless you have kids, you know, human kids that are going to drink a lot of goat milk. So those Nigerian dwarfs that give about a quart or so of goat milk are perfect for small families, are perfect for adults who just want a little bit of milk that's not going to go bad before they can drink it all. There's the Ober Hosleys, which are very similar in appearance, have a nice looking coat. I really like them. You don't find many of those around here. Dairy goats do better in the north. They originate from the north, except for the Nubian, which originates from Africa. There's the Toggenbergs. Those are a pretty good breed. And there's also the Sable. You don't see very many Sables around here. You're going to see a good number of Alpines, some Sonnen, some Nubian, some Lamacha, and, and a good bit of Nigerian dwarfs. I make fun of the Lamacha, and I tell people those are not goats. Those are some kind of alien. <laughs> I don't know what, but they got these little nubby ears. Their ears barely stick out or don't stick out at all. So I said, those are just too weird for me. And if you want to see something really weird, you cross a La Mancha with Alpine, La Mancha with San, and La Mancha with a Nubian, and you get a goat that has one little short nubby ear and then has a full ear on the other side. It just weirds me out. <laughs> but that's me. That's my problem. Then there's uh, also for dairy, there are a breed or two of hair sheep. <clears throat> the St. Croix is kind of known for its uh, uh, ability to produce some milk, and it's got that same long, narrow body as most dairy goats have. But there again, you can cross up your dairy goats and get that hybrid vigor, and you still get your productivity on your milk. I, on the other hand, used to like to use a boar buck to breed my dairy does because what would happen is I'd get any male offspring were deemed to be meat goats. So I got plenty of goats to go to market. Uh, and usually the females, the offspring females, you breed them back to dairy buck and they would be really good producers of milk when you got the board uh, alpine cross or whatever you want for the offspring now having said all that everybody's got their favorite breed everybody's got their favorite colors the milk can sometimes vary from breed to breed i used to call the sonnens the uh, uh, low fat uh, milk of the dairy goats it just tends to have a lower butter fat content so the Alpine, again, they tend to produce, I think Ober, Hosley, and Togberg, they tend to produce a higher butter fat content in their milk. Now, granted, trying to get butter out of goat milk, which is naturally homogenized, you're not going to get much butter. But if you enjoy that sort of thing, you can do it. But each one of these breeds is known for something just a little bit different. 
Ah, if we get to the fiber pets or, or land clearing, what we talked about a little while ago. I, I really am not a fan of wool sheep. There's, so I won't present much information. There are numerous, numerous breeds out there that originate from all over the world, but there's a whole lot of challenges with wool sheep. Hair sheep, their coat naturally sheds and fall off every year. So you don't have to get them shorn about May or June. And so if you look at wool sheep, you're going to have to find somebody to shear them or you're going to have to learn how to shear them yourself. Now, I don't know about the past few years, but years before that, the nearest person coming around to shear sheep and they go on a schedule rotating around the state or whatever, multi-state, was from North Carolina, I believe, North Carolina, South Carolina. And trying to get him down here was not easy, let alone get a, a reliable schedule. And so at one time there was a fellow that lived here that shore sheep, and but he moved to Dothan. There was another fellow over in uh, Winchester, Tennessee. He and his son, you know, shore sheep, but uh, they they got out of the business after a while. Dad got too old and fat to do it, and the son realized it was too much work that they were known for shearing. Then you got to try and find a place to sell the wool. Unless you can find somebody that wants to further cross the wool, spin it, make arts and crafts with it, make scars with it, you've got to find some place to sell that wool in bulk. And the only place I know of, if they still do it, is up in uh, Columbia, Tennessee, once a year. They have what they call the, the Tennessee Wool Pool, P-O-O-L. And everybody brings their big bags of wool in there, big old cotton bag stuff with wool, big old plastic bags, and, and sells them there. And the challenge is getting a profitable price for the wool. The reality is if you start adding in feed, cost of feed and hay and the animals, it won't be profitable. Like I say, unless you find a specialty market. So, uh, like I said, I could go into the breeds of wool sheep, but I just can't recommend anybody get involved in that. They, they do have good personalities, but that's all you can say for them. And, and the, the meat, the meat from wool sheep does not taste as good as the meat from hair sheep. The, and here's my theory, and nobody's ever proved me wrong, the meat, from a wool sheep tastes like lanolin. Whenever lanolin, L-A-N-O-L-I-N. And it, to me, when I eat the meat from wool sheep, and especially if it's overcooked, I just can't wash my tongue enough because it feels like there's a coating of lanolin on my tongue. Whereas the uh, hair sheep, they, they don't have that aftertaste. So if you're going to raise them for pets, I, that's fine. I totally understand that. Uh, bottle babies that you've had to raise or somebody else has raised. In other words, the mama didn't give them enough milk or they were uh, baby number four or four and they just weren't getting the milk so you bottle fed them, the mama died, whatever. Those make real good pets because they're used to being handled by people. They aren't really going to struggle a whole lot. And they're used to coming up for that bottle. They'll get to where they'll run to you if they see a bottle, you know, it's, even as they get older. Uh, their demeanor is going to vary on each one of these animals. I wouldn't say necessarily, well, if you get the son and kid, it's going to make a better pet. I expect it would, but there's no guarantee on that. The uh, dairy breeds are more docile. Uh, you get some of those meat goat breeds. Yes, they can be friendly, especially if they're bottle babies, but uh, they tend to be a little bit more aggressive, the, the boar, the son, and some of that stuff. They just soon take you out as to have them scratch behind ears. <laughs> and then the crossbreeds. If you can crossbreed a, a dairy goat with a meat goat and you bottle feed it, you're going to have a fairly gentle animal unless something goes wrong to convince them they shouldn't be friendly. But those crossbreeds, you get hybrid vigor out of that. You get something, you know, that's more hardy. So it's a good thing. Get, getting goats for land clearing, that there's been lots done on that. And yes, it can be done. And the studies promote that avoids the use of chemical sprays on these clearing areas. 
or uh, bush hogs, all the noise, you know, mechanical equipment, weed eaters, you know, all this stuff. The, the challenge comes from keeping them contained in there. If you don't have some parameter fence, then they're going to wander eventually. They're going to decide to go see what's on the other side of the woods and they're going to wander. So you have to be able to fence in that area or if you have lots of money, you can put up portable electric fencing to contain them. That stuff's a little bit expensive, but in some situations. So if, if I'm going to use some animals to do clearing, it's either going to it more than likely it's going to be meat goats or castrated male dairy goats or castrated meat goat males. It's going to be the reason I wouldn't use the dairy does. You don't want them scratching their udder, or messing up their udder, uh, getting infection in it, and then next thing you got mastitis. You won't want them getting in there with the stickers and vines and the trees that have the thorns and things like that, and risk damaging your udder. So it tends needs to be. Uh, castrated males, whether it be a uh, hair sheep or otherwise. Uh, there again, if you put wool sheep out there, they're gonna come home with all kinds of stickers and stuff and could possibly get entrapped to the point they can't make it in one night and the coyotes get them or stray dogs. So that's my thoughts on land clearing. It can be done with uh, even using brush pygmy. Of course, they aren't gonna consume as much as the meat goats or the dairy goats. Are you ready for a few more questions now, Robert? Yeah, I, that's why I was just looking at my clock. I think, yeah. Okay, good. Um, let's see. I'm going to try to catch back to where we were. Um, where uh, Constance asks, where could I find a list of locations that process goats if I am not up for doing it myself? <laughs> that's a good question because, number one, unless you're going to sell the meat for you, uh, uh, restaurants or, or grocery stores, which most people don't, you're in good luck. Because if you're going to sell it to restaurants or uh, grocery stores, it's going to have to be USD inspect, USDA inspected meat. In other words, it's got to have a plant, a, a processing factory that has actual USDA inspectors there. If you're going to do like I said earlier and just sell it maybe a whole processed animal or you know a half an animal or certain cuts you can sell that to individuals but it has to be processed at a state inspected facility now those state inspected facilities pretty much follow the same standards of cleanliness sanitation whatever you want to call it is the usda inspected they just don't have inspectors on, on hand to do that USDA inspection. Now, inspectors are going to come through there and check the plant, the, uh, the abattoir, the processor from time to time, but uh, I think they inspect about once every couple of weeks or once a month. So that that's uh, now years ago, the state, the Alabama Department of Ag and Industries has a list. It's uh, been a long time, so I tried to search for it has a list of state approved or state inspected facilities. And there's quite a few of them out there. Uh, I think there's still one down in Coleman. Uh, where else? They're well, not as plentiful as they used to be, but a lot of times if you're willing to use a deer processor, if they're willing to do a goat or sheep, which they won't be during deer season, but any other time of the year, They've got the equipment that's needed, and they'll, they'll do. Most of them do a pretty good job if they don't go, don't go back a second time. But so that, there's your state inspected facilities, your uh, deer processors, and then there's the USDA inspected facility. You'll just have to do a search, and like I say Department of Ag and Industries used to have a list of the state inspected facilities. Next question. Okay, Julie asks. Um, what should be the expected price range for a registered dairy doling and buckling? <clears throat> Anywhere from $50 to easily four or $500. Because when you just ask for general price, I'm going to tell you it depends because if they're registered animals, they're going to want a little bit higher price. In other words, if they have the paperwork that certifies they are, you know, full-blooded or registered Nubian or they're full-blooded registered Alpines. 
these people are raising uh, high, generally raising high quality animals that have paperwork to go with them. And they may even show at the uh, uh, competitions like the Lincoln County Fair that has a dairy goat show every year. So those animals are gonna to tend to cost more. If you're just buying old uh, uh, non-registered animal and the, the farmers try not to make a killing off just you on price, you know, I wouldn't pay more than 50 to $100 for a doling or, or buckling. But, and I, I don't think prices have changed much in the years, but easily, you could easily spend a little bit over $100, $150, but usually at that price, they're six months of age. And if you buy something six months of age, it's more likely to survive than something that's two or three months and just weaned from its mother. What, what is the typical price for a Nigerian dwarf goat? What is the typical price? Yes. Okay. Uh, there again, you can pay anywhere from $25 to a couple hundred dollars. It depends on whether they're doing registered goats, whether they're, I'm not sure if there is a goat registry for those. Or, you know, if they've got high quality breeding stock, they're going to ask a, a higher price. Because, yeah, there's show goats that always get tend to get a premium price. There's breeding stock that get a slightly elevated price. And then there's just old regular goats that you're going to turn out in your backyard and not care about. They should be anywhere from $25 to $100. Okay. Um, Cindy asks, are there animals who do not pasture well with goats? Well, not really. The, the, uh, and I'll tell you this, like I was saying earlier, the meat goats I had were a little, and dairy goats were a little bit more aggressive with a hair sheep. You can put them out there with cattle, but you better have the right kind of fence that the goats can't come through, goats or sheep. We'll address that in a minute. Uh, they do pretty good with horses. The only story I'm going to share is that is, I used to uh, try and feed my horses in elevated feed stands and my goats would decide that they could jump up with their front feet on that feed stand and try and get some of that horse's feed. And after I got kicked twice and came to the second time, I decided that I was going to feed my horses in a separate pasture from the goat. <laughs> so that the, the horses can get aggravated with the goats and they weren't trying to, I mean, they were trying to kick the goats. Unfortunately, I was standing right close by there and wasn't as fast as the goat to get out of the way. But uh, like I say horses, cattle, they do okay. I probably wouldn't put them with pigs. Uh, there's probably going to say, well, I've run mine with pigs and they're fine, but sometimes those pigs can get a little bit aggressive. But if, and there again, if you're feeding your horses in the barn, your goats are going to go in there and want to get in their food. So you're going to have to come up with a little bit different management strategy. Now, I'm raising uh, my goats with cattle because they would eat some things that cattle wouldn't, you know, the browse and the forbs and stuff like that, some of the weeds, and the same for my hair sheep. And the cattle just want grass and clover, grass and clover for the most mm -hmm. part, the same for horses. And I will say this, my sheep did a better job of mowing a pasture than my goats did. You know, horses and goats are a little bit more picky. They go around eat here, go around eat there. Sheep are like, let's just mow on through here, ma'am. <laughs> That's funny. Um, Julie says, asks, is there a concern with dairy goats browsing woods and the milk quality such as flavor? Uh Generally, no. Now, it depends what's in there. Uh, uh, some people say, for example, and this is in the woods, but when wild garlic come in or, or wild onions and dairy goats eat it, some people say you can taste it in their milk. I never had that problem or had that experience, but they say, you know, wild garlic and wild onions. Generally, you can turn your goats and browse, and it's, you know, woodland situation it's not going to be a problem. There's always exception to the rule, like there's that black cherry tree or mimosa tree or something like that that you may have to go in and cut out. But generally, they'll do just fine. 
can, most of that vegetation found in trees and browse has a higher protein level than grass. Uh, around here, unless you're fertilizing your pastures, most grass in most pastures is only nine to 10 percent protein. And you get in some of those, and I've done presentations on browse, the nutritional value of browse, and most of that stuff, especially when it's young, tender growth, has a good nutrient level to it. Now, towards the end of the summer, not as good, but those goats like those crunchy leaves. Hair sheep do too. Okay, um, Roberta asked, do you have to have more than one goat for them to do well? Go goats are kind of like pack animals. They do a little bit better if they've got a buddy or two to hang out with. Now, sometimes you'll see them fighting and you'll think that's just like two brothers or two sisters, but uh, that's more or less for entertainment for them, a little bit of a sport. But yeah, I encourage people, don't get just one goat, especially if it's a Nubian, because every time it sees you, it's going to want to talk to you. <laughs> but, uh, and that's, that's not all Nubians are like that, but I encourage people to get at least two or three so you've got something to keep each other company and look out for each other. What uh, Constance asks, what sort of vaccinations should a goat have or what should a goat be tested for when we are shopping for good quality goats? Well, it depends on what extreme you want to take. Uh, I, I'm a, a basic type person when it comes to raising livestock. The one vaccination I always gave my goats and my hair sheep was C, D, and T. The letter C, the letter D is in dog, and letter T is in tetanus, because that's what that T stands for. It's anti-tetanus, because all it takes is a goat or sheep or horse or a cow to scratch itself on a barbed wire fence or you know catch on a nail, step on a nail, whatever, and tetanus is gonna be a problem. The C and D, is for overeating disorder. Now for people that do not feed grain feed, that's not gonna be an issue, you know, but if they feed a lot of grain feed, they better have that CD, C and D, CD of vaccination. But the CD is easily found in all feed stores and, and co-ops, and it's very inexpensive to give to your animals. Now I used to know which one causes uh, uh, bumps on them and which one doesn't but that's a whole nother story in itself but uh the the cd and t now there's all kinds of vaccinations out there there's vaccinations for uh caseous lymphadenitis cl there's vaccinations for pink eye i think there's probably vaccinations for sorma there's vaccinations for other kind of bizarre diseases that goats and sheep rarely get but maybe cattle get. But the likelihood of some of these other disease outbreaks are slim to none. Now, if it makes you sleep better at night, go ahead and go for all those vaccinations out there. But to me, it's just more maintenance than I like to take on. But that CDNT is going to be your number one. It doesn't cost that much. And with animals, you do it once a year. So it's, you know, it's no biggie. Once a year, you round up all your animals. Uh, with the ewes and does, if they're pregnant, you give it to them 30 days before they kid or lamb, and it's passed on to the offspring, the, the kids or the lamb. Now, you still have to give the lambs or kids a series of uh, three vaccinations to boost them up, but most of the time with adults, it's just once a year you're doing this, and if you've got a specific breeding season where all your does get bred in uh, uh July and they're going to kid or lamb in December, go ahead and give them the CD&T vaccine in December, uh, November and they're already vaccinated and you got a head start on those kids or lambs. Okay, another question. Joseph asks, is the stockyard in Coleman a good place to buy or do you recommend a local farmer? I would choose a local farmer before I choose a stockyard. Because here's the thing to think about. What happens at the stockyard is people are not taking their best animals there. 
just like when you go to buy animals from somebody, they're not selling you their best animals most of the time. So they could be taking a, a, a goat there, a female goat that has a bad case of mastitis, but she's not bred at that time. You don't know it. You end up buying a doe with mastitis. Now, can you buy from a stockyard? Yeah, you can. I mean, there's the Coleman Stockyard. Uh, you can drive up the road to uh, uh, Columbia, Tennessee, where they have a, a huge goat sale and sheep sale. Uh, I don't know if they still do it, but the one over there in Russellville, uh, they used to have a goat sale and sheep sale. I think it was on Mondays. But, you know, that's, that's a good opportunity to pick up pink eye, sore mouth. You, you're, do they need the business? Yes, but let them sell them to uh, meat processors. Don't necessarily, unless you absolutely got to, go in there and buy something there. You know, I'd, I'd find me a farmer that had goats or sheep for sale and was at the auction and say, hey, I'd like to buy some goats or sheep, but I'd like to come to your farm. And that way you get to pick out their better animals more than likely because otherwise they'd already be at the sale barn. Next. Um, last question is, what um, does a Nigerian dwarf goat eat and what does it produce? Uh, it's a goat, so it's going to eat grass. It's going to eat browse, forbs. It's going to eat, I mean, everything a regular goat eat. And we'll talk about nutrition in a few minutes. Like I said, uh, a small animal like that is not going to consume a whole lot. But, you know, in a smaller pasture, you know, if you got a quarter acre, half acre, that's going to be more than enough for a couple of uh, dwarf Nigerian. And what was the other part of the question? Um, what does it produce? Oh, well... <laughs> Uh, so some of those, you can use them as meat goats, the females. You know, they've been bred, they've kitted. You can use them for some milk. Uh, other than that, they can be used as pets. Other than that, they, they make a nice barbecue. <laughs> and take them to the sale barn or whatever you want to do with them. But okay, that's, yeah. that's all. Well, actually, I have one question for you. I've never really considered a hair sheep. Um, right. If we were looking for a family pet slash brush goat, brush goat yeah. does a hair sheep work for that? Uh, if you're considering a pet, hair sheep are a little bit crazy. <laughs> I would not recommend, I mean, I'm not to say that, you know, you get a bottle fed hair sheep lamb, it's probably going to be somewhat friendly. But those hair sheep, uh, they remind me of Kiko goats. They're about crazy as all get out. But, you know, of course, I admit they tasted good and they did a better job maintaining my pastures. But uh, I would not take in an adult. And even one <clears throat> you got one six months of age <clears throat> might, not, might not adopt or adapt very well to being a pet. If you got somebody that says, yeah, I got a bottle baby hair sheep for sale, I'd say, okay, let me give it a try. Okay. Thank oh, you. and along those lines, folks, be careful when you go out and buy powdered uh, uh, milk replacer. And I killed five goats in one season, five ba bottle babies in one season doing this. Look at the bag of milk replacer on the ingredients. If it's dairy based, you're okay using on your goats or sheep. If it's plant based, their stomachs are not ready for plant-based nutrition. So stick with the dairy. Now, the other thing to do, and you might want to, everybody write this down, you take one gallon of whole milk, a cup of buttermilk, and a cup or a small can of evaporated milk, like six ounce, eight ounce at the most, but six ounce. So a six ounce can of evaporated milk, a cup of buttermilk, and a gallon of whole milk and you mix it together, that's the best milk replacer you can get, and they can handle that. But I, I killed five goats and one, <clears throat> kids in one year, one summer, because I was feeding a milk replacer, and I didn't, didn't know about the plant-based versus the dairy-based. 
And that's um, whole cow's milk, one gallon whole cow's milk. Whole cow. Unless you know somebody you can buy some goat's milk from, in which case that's great too, uh, which you can feed that to lambs too. But if you some, have somebody say, I'll sell you a gallon of goat milk for $5, you know, say, well, hey, I'll take it and put it in the freezer because it's still good later on. <clears throat> but, uh, in, you know, given you may not have access to goat milk, uh, that whole gallon of whole milk, a cup of buttermilk, and a can of evaporated milk is a perfect combination. Bottle feeding animals is not cheap by any means. Anytime they get mama's milk instead of something you had to go to the store and buy, that's good. Okay, do we want to take a break? Do we want to go on? I'm good to go on if you want to. I say keep going. There's uh, one more question. Sure. Um, I think you talked a little bit about this, but if you could touch on it more. What are the regulations about selling goat milk to people for pets? Okay, that's a different question. Selling goat milk to people for pets. Okay, let's address that. And then if you got another one, we'll address it. <clears throat> The regulations are you must have the container labeled for pets only. Now, there has been talk about another one of the requirements, and it is a requirement. You're supposed to, just like if you buy human feed or, or pet food, they put the protein levels and the fat levels and this and that and the other levels on there. Uh, some of those health inspectors, if they catch you, not all, but some, if they catch you selling pet use only milk, goat milk, they're going to say, where's your nutrition label? And you also, not only do you have to label for pet use only, you have to label what, what farm it came from and maybe even the date of milking if you wanted to go a step further. Now, there's the old joke that if somebody buys pet quality goat milk, what they do with it after they get it home is their business. It ain't the seller's business. I think, think that should pretty much address that. If not, somebody asked another question, I'll try and address it a little bit more. Next question. Okay, and one more. How long will goats live? <clears throat> yeah. Extension answer is that depends. <laughs> because, uh, it, I mean, it can depend. It depends on so many things. The average healthy goat that is not attacked by coyotes or dogs or gets a head stuck in the fence uh, should live anywhere from <clears throat> six or seven years on up to 10 or 12 years. I mean, I've heard of goats living a little bit longer, but that's very rare. If I were to narrow it down, I would say uh, uh, six to eight years. Now, they're not very productive as they get on up in age, but uh, that they'll live that long if you've got one as a pet. But, you know, that depends on if they have problems with gastrointestinal parasites, if they have other health problems, if they're not getting enough nutrition, they may not live as long. So, but basically if I, you know, say the average healthy goat is gonna live probably six to eight years. There's always an exception to that rule. <laughs> that is all the questions for now. Well, great. Well, hopefully we'll come up with some more after we go through the last few slides. Okay, nutrition. Oh my goodness. You know, on Andy Griffith, we used to see with that goat that ate the dynamite and they were all afraid the dynamite was going to explode in the goat. We didn't want to stress out the goat. But I'm going to tell you that I highly encourage people to use pre-mixed rations. If they've got to feed, if they've got to increase the nutritional level of their goats or hair sheep, which certain stages of production you will, only use pre-mixed rations. Those are generally balanced by a nutritionist, a livestock nutritionist, and they know what nutrition levels these animals need, what uh, uh, vitamins, what minerals, you know, how much, what percentage, you know, all these good things. So having said that, <clears throat> goats generally 10 to 16%. Now let me clarify this and apply to hair sheep too. A maintenance animal <clears throat> that's not bred 
and not in breeding season will get by on that 10%. Now, that's for goats or sheep. If you're trying, if you're getting ready to breed your ewes or does or use your male for breeding season, you better increase that protein level. Uh, goats probably 14 to 16%. The hair sheep, I would increase at least 12, uh, maybe a little bit more. Uh, whether it be sweet feed or whatever you know you're using, uh, I would recommend a goat ration or sheep ration, specific to the animals you have. But uh, that that's you know people start trying to mix their own feed, and that's when you get in trouble because you don't know about the quality of the ingredients. You may hear this was good, you may hear that was good, and so and so uses this, so I'm going to use this. Uh, that's fine if you're happy with that, but I recommend a pre-mixed ration if you're going to have to feed them feed. Ideally, they can find enough nutrition out in the pasture and woods. They don't have to have that, but that's not the case most of the times. Make sure they have mineral, uh, either loose minerals, access to loose minerals, or make sure they have a mineral tub. It's kind of like a, a black sorghum syrup type tub, the hard syrup and they can lick that. You can put a mineral block, don't put a salt block out there, white block, put a red block. They don't need the extra salt in the diet, kind of like I don't need it in my diet. But uh, minerals are something they need, and they know how much they need. They may not even eat it for the longest time, and all of a sudden, next thing you know, they're consuming those minerals. Now, when I say a tub or a block, a hard block, like you put out your horse or cattle, think about this. Sheep and goats do not have upper teeth. They just have lower teeth. So they cannot bite into that tub of molasses mix. They cannot bite into that hard block, that red mineral block, to get the minerals they need. That's why buy some loose mineral, mix it in with their feed. If they don't want it, you'll notice they're leaving a bunch of mineral behind after they eat their feed, and then you just put less mineral right there. Water is absolutely essential. You know, people don't think of that as a form of nutrition, but trust me, it is because it carries all the nutrients through their bodies. But they need good, clean water. I used to like to put a little apple cider vinegar in my water because it kept it the goat's water, not mine. <laughs> goat's and sheep water and the horse's water because it kept the algae down a little bit, made it easy. What algae did form was easy to clean out of the tank. And there's some people that say apple cider vinegar is good for the animal's digestive system. There's different types of feed out there. Like I said, you know, this, whatever you're going to do, if you're, it's breeding season, you better up that protein level for two, for two reasons. It makes your male goat more fertile. It makes your female goat produce more eggs in your ovaries and more likely to have uh, hopefully just tw twins but less likely that singles if you boost up that protein level. Uh, forages, like I said earlier, most grass here in the South, unless it's fertilized, you're lucky if it's 10%. Now, I have had some tested through uh, Auburn lab or state lab, and it tests a little bit higher, but they used a lot of fertilizer. Now, crabgrass is one of the best forms of grass out there for horses, goats, and sheep. It's slightly higher in protein levels, and uh, it's very prolific. Now, uh, clover is good for them as long as it's not an entire field of clover. There again, it's like me. I could eat hot dogs all day long, but that's not good for my diet. So clover, you know, all day long for goats or sheep is not necessarily good. I wouldn't go to the trouble to eradicate it but I would add some grass seed and maybe some browse or forbs out there if I could. Browse, forbs, and I forget what, they're the broadleaf weeds, basically, the broadleaf weeds, weeds, including uh, some of the thistle plants. Browse is gonna be your trees, your blackberry uh, bushes, things that are high in tannins, which are actually good for helping control parasites. You know, and, and browse, you have to be careful of that because goats will go in and they'll decimate a woodland area, given the chance and the high enough uh, uh, population of goats. So if you want that, and I've seen goats and hair sheep 
go into a woodland situation and eat all the lower branches and leaves off there and it leave it looking like a park because those goats and sheep will stand on hind legs and reach up there and get all that high stuff and then it's just like a park from six foot down it's nice and clear you can walk around it the problem if you let them do that too often is that tree won't go any lower branches back and they don't have anything to consume in the next couple of years <clears throat> now and i'm just kind of marching through this a goat and uh hair sheep will consume any easily any anywhere from two to four percent of its body weight so if you've got a hundred pound uh goat out there you better figure it's going to eat at least two to four pounds of combination of feed hay and whatever they find to browse or forage on graze on and then a sheep's pretty much the same way they may eat a little bit more but you might say three to five percent but it's real similar to a goat and there again that includes the grass they eat the forbs they eat the browse they eat the hay they eat and uh the pre-mixed rations you may provide them with and then uh, the other thing going back to nutrition make sure your does or ewes that are lactating lactating to feed their babies are getting plenty of nutrition so they can produce plenty of milk for those offspring facilities oh my gosh so many of us have to make do with what we got when it comes to shelter but one thing we know is whether it's goats or hair sheep they need shelter from rain wind sun and very extremely cold temperatures uh, those mornings in the winter when it gets down below uh, well below freezing they need to be able to come in the barn and get out of the worst of the weather because they can kind of use body heat and the heat from the ground to keep them from freezing to death uh, goats don't like getting wet hair sheep aren't quite as bad about that and if it's cold and windy that just drops the body temperature and some of those animals you know the sun causes them to overheat especially those that originate from france and netherlands things like that switzerland but keep it practical these barns don't need to be fully enclosed because then it restricts airflow and if there's too much urine in, in the ground and there's been a water leak and it's just damp in there there's possibility of, of uh, pleurisy developing in your goats or pneumonia and uh they need to have good clean air uh, one of the barns i designed for research project over at the sand mountain research station had solid walls on two out of four sides the other walls were about six foot off the ground the top of the walls were about six foot off the ground so the sheep couldn't come over there and hopefully dogs and coyotes couldn't get in but the the north and the uh, west side of the building had solid walls and did the same thing at a research project there at Alabama A&M in Hazel Green. And uh, so you're trying to, you don't want the rain blowing in on them. You, you know, you don't want the snow blowing in on them. Uh, if you're trying to figure out how much space you need in your barn, you better guarantee them at least 24 square foot per adult. That's basically four by six. You know, I mean, you're talking about something that's, you know, that wide and as tall as me because I'm 6'1". Now, if you, get, you know, crowd them in there, they're going to start fighting, overcrowding, just like you overcrowd a bunch of people in small space, the goats are going to get stressed out. I don't care what form of livestock it is, they're all getting stressed out when they get crowded and start headbutting and biting each other and things like that. And a lot of times it's the baby animals that suffer because they get stepped on because mama can defend herself. And you probably need to be able to set aside for your bottle babies, for your mamas that just had babies. Even if you just put the mama and, and baby in there for a few days, they can kind of bond with their mother better. If you leave mamas out there with a whole herd, sometimes those baby get separated from them and mama can't get to them and, and the baby just doesn't make it. And it's really kind of sad because if you're able to set aside kidding areas or lambing pens, you know, something is just four by four, six by six, no bigger than that. 
and uh, where the mama and the babies can bond with each other. And then once you turn loose a couple days later, there's no problem. So let's talk about fencing. This is something I learned a lot about over the years. Uh, USDA in Tennessee offers fencing classes at least once a year in the different counties. I have yet to see USDA in Alabama offer fencing classes, but there's all kinds of information on the internet on fencing this uh, anymore anyways, YouTube and whoever. <clears throat> so no barbed wire. Barbed wire is not going to keep in goats or sheep. You'd have to put your strands of barbed wire, you know, four to six inches apart to contain a goat or sheep. Not to mention you risk scratching the udders on the does or the scrotum on the male goats, yeah, with the barbs. Uh, do not use the livestock fence with six inch squares. What happens is a goat sticks its head through there to get on whatever is on the other side of the eat, and it can't get its head back through there because its horns catch. And uh, even if you're using a, a, a dehorned goat, they have trouble getting their head back through that six by six square. I recommend if you can afford it, and it tends to be more expensive, go on the livestock fence, it's little four by four squares. However, that's more uh, expensive. So I say, well, just go with the cattle wire that starts out kind of narrow, and then it gets to be about six inches tall by 12 inches wide towards the top half, and the goats can get their heads in and out of that. But uh, cattle fence will work pretty good. Are the babies going to go through there? Yeah, but as soon as mama calls them or they get hungry, they're going to be back through that. Don't pretend like you can't remember, but trust me, they can. Uh, electric fence. <clears throat> electric fence works real good with goats or sheep. It's good if you're using like high tensile wire or uh, uh, twisted wire, it's easily going to take six strands. At the bottom, you'll put it about four to six inches, you know, four to six inches off the ground. As it goes higher, you can put a little bit further apart, but the first few strands are going to be about six inches apart. And make, make sure you have a good, strong charger with that. But I've used high tensile wire, and it worked great because that will definitely carry some electricity. And unfortunately, our property is right along a creek, and we we're in a holler, and it tended to flood real bad. And one year, it flooded so bad, it washed trees and branches over that high tensile wire and pushed them over, and they never did work right after that. But I learned from that, you know, my trial that it does, it does, high tensile wire does work and it's somewhat affordable. Now, you can buy this uh, new stuff that's relatively new on the market. When I say new, it's been out about six years. It's called high tensile electric fence. And it's basically a high tensile electric fence. It's basically very similar to field fence but has bigger squares, more like cattle fence. It's, but it's made out of a different type of metal that are better capable of carrying electricity. And of course, it has to be kept off the ground. But, you know, there again, you can use a weed eater. You can use some chemical if you just want to. But uh, that's always an option right there, that high tensile. Uh, sometimes you can find it at the co-op. Sometimes you can find it at the farm supply places. Uh, and there's a fellow out of Coleman, I forget his name or what the company is, but uh, he's actually, the, I'm told, the one that invented this high tensile electric fence, which there again, it'll short out of the touch of the ground or if it touches metal or wood. So you've got to put those plastic insulators on your T-post and on your wood post to uh, run that high tensile electric fence. But man, I learned real quick, that stuff works great. There's also that portable electric net fencing, uh, usually comes in 50 foot rolls, 100, 150 foot rolls. It's very pricey, but uh, it can be used to contain animals in small areas. And it doesn't matter if it touches the ground, or at least that bottom strand, because it's kind of neutral wire anyways. On that high tensile electric fence, when I used that, I only had, I never had an adult go through it. Because I said the squares are pretty big. I had babies go through it twice. 
they wouldn't come back through it. They said, oh no, I don't want any more of that. So I learned that high tensile electric fence work. It's less expensive than uh, uh, your regular livestock fence and just easier to work with too. It's not near as heavy. But the other thing we forget about is electric chargers. You can use the solar chargers. They don't carry as much electricity and give them a week without uh, sunshine and they lose charge really quick, even with a, a boat battery. But if I'm shopping for a charger, <clears throat> I'm gonna look for something that has eight joules or more. In other words, I want it to shock dogs or coyotes if they're gonna try and come through the fence. I want it to shock any goat that thinks it has a bright idea. It's gonna go through that fence over and into where that lush clover is. I want them to think twice about going through there. It's not gonna kill them. I mean, yes, if they got tangled up in it, it might shock them to death, but more than likely they're gonna to touch it with their nose or ear and they're gonna say, oh, I don't want any part of that. So, but usually these better don't, you know, the better chargers will tell you how many joules they offer. Some of these cheap chargers are gonna tell you, well, it covers so many miles of fence. That still doesn't tell me a thing. How much electricity is going to carry through there? How many joules is it going to carry? Is what I want to know. Here's the next big question. How much land do I need for raising goats or sheep? And that, you know, there again, it goes to that answer. That depends. It depends on how many animals you're going to try and put out there per acre. For example, it used to be they'd tell you, oh, you can put eight to 10 goats or sheep per acre anymore they don't recommend that many uh, you know they recommend about six but there again if you can't rotate your animals if they're not divided into paddocks you need to lower that down a little bit more uh, now if you have rotational pastures and can rotate the animals on the pastures every two weeks to 30 days you can put more animals on there because you're going to be putting them on a paddock or a small grazing area and you're going to be moving them on in, you know, a week or two, three, four later, whatever. But don't forget about when you're talking about rotating pastures, the average life cycle of a gastrointestinal parasite is about 30 days. Actually, it's a little bit less, but let's just say 30 days. So if you put them on one pasture and they drop fecal pellets there with worms in them, and you let the goats or sheep keep on grazing that, they're going to pick the goats and worms up from there. If you can move them to another pasture, the the goats aren't going to have enough goats. The worms aren't going to have a real strong life. You know, they they it's going to struggle to survive. And also on your pastures, never let them get below six inches. I jokingly call it those stomach worms have uh, altitude sickness. They can't go more than six inches on vegetation. Because that's what happens. Those those uh, worms lay the eggs, and the, the eggs hatch, and the larva clot climbs up the grass. And then here comes a goat or sheep and eats short grass, get ingests the larva, and the larva grows into a worm in the stomach, lays more eggs, and the cycle continues. Uh, and look at your pasture and see what's there. You have to study your pasture. Get you measuring a stick or a measuring stick that shows six inches and walk around there and make sure none of your pastures are below six inches. And if they are, move them on to another pasture. Uh, and then look what, what the makeup is out there. Is it just grass? Did somebody spray a lot of uh, broadleaf weed spray and kill all the clover? Because clover is our friend. It put nitrogen back into the soil. It fixes nitrogen in the soil. Now, excess, like I said earlier, is not necessarily good, but get some grass growing out there, get some legumes, find some browse or some kind of forbs you can plant out there. Uh, Cerethal espadiza in small quantities is good and high in tannins. So, you know, get a mixture going out there if you can. Now, trees, you're going to have to wait till the trees to get, grow tall over six foot or more before you turn goats and sheep loose in there, but it's always good to have trees that eventually become shade too. Predators, oh my gosh, there's two-legged and there's four-legged. Uh, these are a serious threat to goats, not as bad as gastrointestinal parasites, but they can be a problem. Uh, what happens is you got dogs and you got coyotes. 
coyotes, I kind of have respect for coyotes because they're not going to bother your animals as long as there's plenty to eat out there, plenty of rabbits, plenty of mice, rats, stuff like that. But if they get hungry, they're going to come either under that fence or they're going to come crawl over that fence, climb over that fence, and they're going to get in there. Now, the reason I say I have respect for the coyotes is they're killing for food. They aren't killing for entertainment like dogs are. Coyotes are going to get in there and kill one or two and, and either haul them off or eat a good bit of them right there. Dogs are going to get in there and chase them till they all die. They die from being bit too many times. They die from a heart attack. They die from stress. Dogs just kill for sport. And that same dog that seems so docile and laid back during the day, when they get out there at night with all the other neighborhood dogs running around, they're going to have a party because they're going to go under fence or over fence, just like coyote. And they're going to chase all those animals till they die. And, and most of them die, leave some maimed. And uh, it's just a really sad situation. <clears throat> Two-legged predators. Yeah, occasionally there's a problem with two-legged predators, not very often, but a, a real good electric fence with that eight to 10 joules that I was talking about, or aggressive large guardian dogs, you know, your Pyrenees, your Anatolian Shepherds, and whatever other breeds are out there these days, they're gonna detour somebody. Now, think about this, and I had to tell people at Sand Mountain Research Station, they wanted the most vicious dog they could get to put with their goats in that research project. I said, okay, you want the most vicious dogs? I said, let's not put dogs, let's put electric fence six, six inches off the ground on the outside, six inches off the ground on the inside and across the top of your fence. And not, not we want the most vicious dogs because we've got certain populations out here that prefer goat meat. I said, so what you're looking to do is you're looking to see in the headlines all across the state, Auburn has vicious dogs that attack and injure people. He said, ooh, we haven't thought about that. Oh, we're going to put the electric fence up like you suggested. So large guardian dogs are good. There again, you got to have them pairs. They work better as a team. Uh, good luck with keeping some of them inside with your goats or sheep. Uh, some of them just aren't going to stay inside. But as long as they do their job, I have no problem with that as long as you don't have any neighbors that are going to be bothered by the, the dogs coming over there. And that's it, folks. What kind of questions we got? Okay, let's see what all we have. We actually, we have a few people that um, joined late. Sure. And so I will, again, if you want to give me your email address in the chat, I'll send you the PDF um, and a video, most of it. So we'll place that on our Facebook too. I forgot to turn it on right in the beginning. Oh, okay, okay um, <clears throat> let's see. Question from Constance. If I see my pasture with plants, what would be good plants to get going out there for a good diet? Okay, I think Constance has reached her limitation on question. <laughs> uh, and what was the question again? What plants would be good to establish for the diet? Get yes. a yeah, get a variety out there. Uh, a lot of times people will see fescue out in their pastures and they'll say, I'm killing that fescue. It causes fescue toxicity, cydia, affects you toxicity, which causes placentas and horses, goats and sheep to thicken. It overheats the animals and uh, I'm getting rid of it all. And I said, good luck on that because a year or two from now, it's all going to come back. I said, the best thing you can do is have a varied diet out there. You might plant some, uh, uh, let the fescue grow, uh, uh, get some crabgrass going out there. Now the downside that is crabgrass seed is very expensive. Uh, get some, uh, what was that stuff? There's several varieties of crabgrass. You can just, and you don't have to seed the whole pasture. You just seed here and there. So keep your cost down. Get some clover growing out there, white clover, red clover, you know, just whatever clover you can get, it's affordable. But take a look at the cost and how much seed per acre or seed per square foot or whatever you're going to have to put out there. Because like I said, I used to be a big advocate for crabgrass. And then, excuse me, I found out that, good Lord, that stuff just jumped in price, skyrocketed in price. 
uh, for the fa late fall and, and winter and early spring, you can put some small grains out there, some uh, rye, some oats, winter wheat. Uh, we really don't rec recommend anymore planting rye grass seed. Used to be, oh yeah, get some rye grass seed, start all that in the small grains in September, get them planted and, and they'll serve you right late uh, winter, early spring. But the problem with rye grass seed is it lasts into the summer so your Bermuda and fescue and, and clover and stuff that's trying to come out is shaded out or covered over by that rye grass. So, you know, talk to other farmers and see what's worked for them. And then go to your, you know, I can make recommendations, but if your feed store doesn't carry it, it doesn't do you any good. Talk to your local feed store and explain that, hey, I'm trying to, or seed store, whatever, farm supply store, I'm trying to increase the variety in my pasture. What can I get? Now, Bermuda grass is everywhere. Now, it'll crowd out fescue grass too, but it only grows in the heat of summer where fescue is a cool season grass. It's more prevalent in the springtime and in the fall time when things go cool off. But variety, that's the thing in whatever is available and affordable. Okay, um, Julie asks, I've heard that you have to feed hay. Is that necessary if your goats will have access to pasture woods, mineralic, and grain, maybe only in the winter? And which kind of hay would you feed them? There again, recommending a type of hay is like recommending a, a breed of goat or sheep or what type of vegetation have growing out there. Uh, let me go back and say this. More than likely, unless you're able to do what they call stockpile forages in your pastures, in other words, you don't get out there and let animals eat all your pasture down in certain areas that you can rotate them to, or you know, you just, as I call it, don't bush hog. You let certain pastures just really grow up. You're, but more than likely, you're going to have to feed hay <clears throat> because you want to keep up their nutrition level and you don't want to feed just grains and mineral and water during the win winter time because they need, the grains have what we call short fiber, you know, feed rations, they have what we call short fiber. You need those long fibers from grass, tree leaves, forbs, and hay to uh, help their digestive system. Other, that the long fiber and hay and grass, whatever it may, clover, whatever it may be, it helps process and move the small grains through their digestive system. So they they really going to need some hay. Nothing else that keeps them from getting bored sometimes during the winter time, especially when it's a rainy day and they can't be out there. Uh, as far as what, if you could find crabgrass hay. That would be fantastic. If you could find a farmer, huh? if you can find a farmer that had soybeans that didn't make, soybean hay is fantastic. Both are high in protein and, and good for the digestive system. Because what you're looking for, and there again, take a hay sample, you're looking for at least 10 to 14 percent protein levels in your hay and greater than 50% TDNs, total digestible nutrients. That means it's gonna, 50% of the food or whatever is in there is gonna be digested by the animal when you go 50% TDNs. And like I said earlier in my nutrition, uh, goats and sheep are gonna eat anywhere from 10 to 14% protein in their diet. More than likely around here, you might find some alfalfa, that's good in small quantities, but I wouldn't feed it to them the entire winter or even every, every week, uh, more than likely you're gonna find fescue or Bermuda grass hay. That's gonna be the most common around here. There again, it's gonna be, if you're lucky, 10% protein, but it's better than nothing. I'll take it over nothing. And what it about, doesn't matter whether it's round bell or square bell. We feed Timothy hay to our rabbits. Can you feed goats Timothy hay? Yeah, yeah. They, 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 the only reason it's not, very common around here, it doesn't do well in the heat of the south. So when you're buying Timothy hay for your rabbits, more than likely it's imported from uh, up north somewhere where it's cooler and they have better soils. But yeah, that, 
uh, I used to, when I used to feed my horses and then still with my goats, I looked for a combination of uh, fescue and, and Timothy hay, Timothy grass hay. Okay, Cindy had the question, what are the advantages and disadvantages of disbudding? Disbudding? Uh, if you don't have a strong stomach when you go to disbud them, because I mean, basically you're taking the equivalent of soldering iron and stick it in their head and burning off that horn bud. If you don't have a strong stomach, it's difficult to do. If you have a big operation, it's difficult to disbud every animal. But uh, the advantages are when the goats get into a fight, they don't have those horns. The disadvantages are when a disbudded goat gets in a fight with a horned goat, the disbudded goat is probably going to lose. And uh, so, you know, there's pros and cons. The advantage to a disbudded goat is it's less likely to get its head, head caught in a fence. You know, and, and but then by the same token, if they have horns, they can kind of protect themselves a little bit. They won't completely defend themselves, but they'll put up a good fight with dogs or coyotes if they have horns. So th there's pros and cons to each one. If you've got a milking stand, you're probably gonna have to disbud. Oops, I think I messed up the screen. <laughs> oh, I thought you still look like you're here. I was trying to um, take yeah, you yeah. off of your shared screen, but it didn't work. Sorry. Oh, okay. Well, we're through with my presentation anyway, so go ahead and ask some more. Uh... Trying to make my screen share go away. Okay. Um, how old should bucklings or dolings be at weaning? Uh, there again, it's that extension answer that depends. <laughs> uh, I would say three to four months because anything less than that, you know, some people do wean them at two months of age. They're not getting all the nutrition they need after that. They're not used to eating the grass. They're not used to eating grains. So they may be lacking in nutrition if you you wean them at two months of age. Now, yes, they will catch up and they will catch on, but uh, I, I prefer to go for the three months. You go a little bit beyond the four months and uh, it just, it shouldn't be needed. Now, will they still nurse on mama? Oh, you're darn right they will, but look silly with that big old kid <laughs> trying to nurse off mama. So. Okay, I think that is all our questions. Does anybody else? have any I have one with the horns if you do like the um the netting electric fence do you have to worry about the goats with horns bothering that the electric fence uh only if they get too close to the fence and touch it with their horns usually once goats and sheep learn about that electric fence they don't want to uh, get too close to that fence trust me <laughs> Okay, one more question from Julie. Have you ever heard of a natural wormer with wormwood? I've heard of, of natural wormers, wormwood, garlic. Uh, and my response to it is, I don't, it may work, but you're going to have to prove to me it works by doing a pre and post fecal exam. So if people tell me that giving them chewing tobacco like I was talking about works that's probably a natural worm or the nicotine kills the worms but until I see a post pre and post uh, fecal exam I can't recommend it because you know technically in my field of science we're recommending things based on uh, research now there's also the tannins from uh, Cerisa lespedeza and alfalfa, those are a natural dewormer. It helps, I shouldn't say dewormer, helps control worms. The problem with too many tannins in the stomach of a goat or sheep, particularly a dairy goat, it kind of messes up the, <clears throat> excuse me, too many tannins in their diet messes up the digestive system where they don't process food efficiently and it can reduce the effectiveness of the uh, nutrition. But yeah, there are some out there, but I haven't done the pre and post with them. 
Okay. Um, several comments that this has been very helpful. Another question from K9 Kim. What is your take on breeding pulled to pulled? I think it's a great idea. You know, you, you may not get pulled in every offspring from that, but I think that's a great idea. It beats the heck out of having to disbud them. <laughs> okay. Um, Joseph says, do you have any books that you would recommend for a beginner? Uh, I'm sure there's a Goats for Dummies book out there. <laughs> <laughs> there's a Goats for Dummies. Uh, there's a bunch of goat books out there. Uh, we had one from Extension for the longest time on raising meat goats. But by the time we wrote all the articles, then they got developed into a book. And four or five years later, the book was published. <laughs> so it was pretty much out. It wasn't outdated information, but it just didn't have that new appeal to it. But yeah, I just go online and read through the reviews. That'll tell you a lot about whether the book was helpful or not. Read through the reviews. Uh, what else? Would it <clears throat> talk to all those goat producers? But yeah, just do, uh, you, know, you know, there again, there's all kinds of resources for that sort of thing. There used to be a, a book put out by Tuskegee University on raising meat goats, and it was one of the best. It was spiral bound, but I don't think it's still out there. I think that just lasted a couple of years and the cost of production was too much. Now, believe it or not, I do like some technology. <laughs> So what I did uh, a couple of years ago, I took all the electronic publications we had on rabbit production, goat production, sheep production, and Auburn put together a bunch of uh, uh, publications on backyard poultry production. And I put all that stuff on a thumb drive. And it seems like it took a four gigabyte thumb drive. Uh, I don't know when I'll be down Calman Way, but I don't mind giving you a copy of that, Rachel, or I can mail you a copy. Right, yeah, that'd be great. And then, you know, if people want it, if you want to put it on a thumb drive, you can put a thumb drive and share them. Like I said, it took about four gigabytes. Or, you know, you can let them copy the, the folder. And, well, it's got four folders, one on goats, one on sheep, one on uh, rabbits, and one on chickens. But it, it's a very, that's probably one of the best things I ever did in my career was to put <laughs> because it's easy you know yes a thumb drive cost you know five six seven eight dollars but it's easier to hand somebody that and if they didn't use it no biggie because we're just giving you know a big old stack of publications and they sit on the shelf and never get read right yeah that would be great we'd like to have a copy of that okay um yeah. one more question um if you had two brush goats um, what would, do you think that having two like weathers or two castrated males would get along well together? Uh, they're going to be like two brothers. They're going to fight, but yeah, they're going to get along fine. Yeah, what do you think the best combination is of keeping if you just had two goats? Two brush goats or two what? Weathers? Two brush goats. Yeah. What would okay. be the best combination? I, as long as either one was red, weathered, they're both going to be good. Uh, I recommend weathering whatever it is, because if you're not going to use them for breeding stock, you know, go ahead and neuter them. Uh, if they're intact, they're going to be more aggressive with each other, because even though there's no girls around, they're still going to think, yeah, I may get lucky one of these days and get a chance to breed, so let me fight with my friend, yeah. Okay. That's good advice. One more, one more question from Julie. Um, any tips for bringing home newly weaned goats to make the transition easier? Yeah. Uh, as far as transportation, transporting from the farm to your house or your farm, cardboard box, if that's all you got, one of those plastic dog crates. You know, it doesn't have to be real big, but plastic dog crates that's got the ventilation on the sides and got the mesh door on the front. Those, those plastic dog crates are great because they're easy to clean out. The cardboard box, you know, I've kept bottle babies in cardboard boxes. The problem is the box gets, box gets saturated eventually with urine 
and then you know what good did that do and it could very easily happen in your car uh, you know with the cardboard's not thick enough but yeah it's just those plastic dog crates are a good cardboard box maybe throw a towel on the bottom of either one you can throw a little bit of hay in there but when you go to pull them out it's going to be get hay scattered everywhere so just take a old bath towel you don't care if you keep it anymore throw it in that cardboard box or throw it in that crate and transport them that way go to a yard sale and get a dog crate right <laughs> sounds like good advice okay i think that's all so um one last time if anybody wants me to email the pdf if you'll put your email in there and otherwise we are done thank you so much robert this was very very interesting oh thank you i had fun i can talk about this forever but it's been <laughs> couple years since I did this. So I appreciate you inviting me because it gives me opportunity to refresh my skills. Can I share your email address as well with the PDF? Oh, of course, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I guess, uh, and I'll send you an email. My question for, I have to use it for reporting purposes. I see we had 13 participants and I saw as high as 20. Yeah, that's, I think with people coming and going, we probably had about 25. Right, right. Plus would... they can only take so much of me. So. <laughs> But yeah, no, but I, I enjoy. Thank you, everybody, for being here and, and taking the time to listen. Okay. Well, everybody, have a good night. I'm going to stay on just to make sure nobody else gives us their email. <laughs>